A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Capus, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Well, this Gospel is classic. John the Evangelist, John the Evangelist's Gospel, of course, is filled with details. And really, it is laden with details because John wanted to make sure that there was no misunderstanding that he was the eyewitness. Now he talks about John the Baptist being the eyewitness, but John is an eyewitness. And John, of course, his gospel is called the theological gospel as opposed to the three synoptic gospels. And I think it's important for us to remember and keep this context that, you know, we're not talking about this gospel being just a years after the Synoptic Gospels. I was just uh, reading something the other day uh, where uh, a friend of mine on social media said he opened up his law practice 30 years ago. 30 years ago. And then he mentioned that it was 1993. And I'm saying, it, 1993 can't be 30 years Right? I mean, it's just too big. Uh, and uh, but when you think about all that has happened since 1993, so when you when you think about the fact that the Synoptic Gospels were written in 60, 65 AD, and now it's 30 years later, there's a lot that had happened in the early church. And John's perspective uh, was much different than the Synoptic Gospels. Of course, that's why we have inclusions in John's Gospel, things that he did not bother discussing. Uh, so it's important that uh, we look at the details in John's Gospel. And then, of course, you have the three letters of St. John, the three commentaries on his Gospel. And it's it's almost like, and, and we, I, I've seen preachers like, and I've done it myself, I give a homily, and then maybe after the prayers of the faithful, I, I realize, oh, I, I, I forgot something, and I'll, I'll tell the people, oh, in my homily, I meant to say this, or let me clarify this. And then there's another clarification after the final prayer. And, and that's kind of like what John does as commentaries. It's kind of like, oh, let me clarify this part of my gospel, right? Uh, but that goes to his just tremendous desire for detail, for detail. And we see this, of course, in the, uh, now him gathering individually uh, the disciples, the apostles that would follow him, including uh, Peter. But I want to talk for a minute about this first letter of John, the third chapter, a few verses. Uh, and again, John comes up with, let no one deceive you. John is big on us looking at ourselves truthfully, being people, Catholics of integrity, and not only in terms of how we view things, but most importantly, how we view ourselves. And then he talks about something that seems very, very clear. The person who acts in righteousness is righteous, just as he, God, Jesus, 
righteous. Whoever sins belongs to the devil, because the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now, if we went around and talked to Catholics, everybody said, well, sure, I'm righteous. I do righteous things, right? I'm not, I'm not a sinner. Uh, and, you know, we, we need to be careful because I see this more and more and more, this whole Protestant mindset seeping into Catholicism. That it's, you know, there's this adage about, you know, you move into a new house. And I, this is very vivid, the first house that I bought. I moved into, the, into to my first house. And I was like, oh man, this house is filthy. And then I lived there five years and I'm moving out and I'm cleaning that house. And it dawned on me after I completed the house. I said, man, this house is as dirty now as it was when I moved in. It's just my dirt. And I was living in my dirt, right? Couldn't live in the other person's dirt, but I can live in my own dirt, right? And this is kind of like the way we view things. And it's very important, uh, especially as we begin this uh, uh, calendar year, to really look at ourselves and say, what does it really mean to be righteous? But if we went line by line in this reading, and because, you know, it doesn't mean that uh, if, if you sin, you're not begotten by God. If you remain in your sin, John's always talking about remaining in Christ, remaining in Him. If you're comfortable remaining in your sin, you got problems. You got problems, right? And regardless of what sin it is, doesn't matter what sin it is. Venial sin, mortal sin, of course, mortal sin would be devastating. But if you're comfortable living in your sin, then you're not righteous. You're not righteous. And this is why I think the sacrament of confession is so, so important. The regular sacrament of confession. It's also, I think, why good sisters understand this. I think you folks uh, understand it. You're here every day. I, I tell people all the time, as soon as I had my adult reversion in the early 80s, I, I realized that when I was a kid, I was going to Mass every day. I need to go to Mass every day. All right? And going to Mass every day causes us to really reflect on where we are in our spiritual life. I always said this, there's no small coincidence. Although those out in the world would think that it's odd, well, if you go to Mass every day, why do you go to confession so often? Well? You go to Mass every day, you're pretty righteous, right? Uh, well, it's no small coincidence that those who go to Mass every day tend to go to confession the most frequently. Why? Because when you're coming up and receiving Jesus, when you are standing before Jesus every single day, you can't help but reflect on your spiritual life, on our spiritual life, and where we are. And that is something we should never, ever lose, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It goes back to, and this is the first reading that John is uh, talking about uh, here. He's talking about, you know, always self-reflecting on our sins. Again, never in a burdensome way. Never be uh, uh, burdened by our sins. But always, always with the mind that we need Christ's mercy so much, so much, and being thankful for his mercy. And indeed, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this is really how we come to remaining in Jesus and remaining in a state of peace, the peace Jesus wants us to have each and every single day. Just one word about... Um, Mother Seton, of course, great American saint and uh, one of my favorite saints. Uh, you know, she is one of these saints, as Mother Teresa is, that we really should emulate because she really understood uh, what it meant uh, to live a sanctifying life. And it really is all about Christ's mercy. And there's one thing I'll repeat all the time. We get easily distracted from the final exam. 
We should be staying focused on our final exam. We should be resolutely determined on our journey to Jerusalem, as Jesus said, as it said about Jesus in Scripture. And being focused on our final exam, what is that? It's about the two aspects of Christ's mercy. Mother Seton, Mother Teresa uh, truly understood this. And it comes to Matthew chapter 25, 31 to 46. Now, you didn't. Hopefully, have good memories. If you remember the responsorial psalm, you remember this. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and Matthew 6, 12 to 15. That's your homework. I'm going to tell you what those verses are. You go home and look them up yourself. 25, 31 to 46, 6, 12 to 15. Focus on those and their spiritual life and face the final exam. Rejoicing in the love of our God, let us pray. For all missionaries who give up everything to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to the Lord. And every nation on earth will adore the Lord and abide by his law, we pray to the Lord. For an end to birth violence and for peace in all world, we pray to the Lord. For all prisoners, Know the freedom, hope, light, and love that is theirs because of the babe of Bethlehem, we pray to the Lord. For the grace to bear witness to Christ, to our family, friends, and all those whom he has brought into our life, we pray to the Lord. And for the holy souls in purgatory, we pray to the Lord. For an end to the conflict in Ukraine and in Israel, and for peace to reign in this country throughout the world, we pray to the Lord. Lord loving Father, we trust in your loving mercy. We beg you to hear our prayers and answer them in accord with your holy will through Christ our Lord. 